morning class today we would be talking about uh, the other phenomena which come under uh, you know environment and uh, we would focus on certain areas such as um, human wildlife conflict what happens when humans and wildlife you know interact with each other and that causes a negative impact and what is the effect on tribal population we would also learn about certain international agreements which are like which has a lot of prominence and they are really important for the exam yeah so let's move so then uh, we have learned about climate change we learned about global warming next we would learn about ozone layer depletion so as you all know because you have all heard of it <coughs> heard of it right sorry okay ozone layer is the layer which protects the earth's atmosphere that is the protective layer around the earth's atmosphere what does it do it uh, passes on heat energy from the earth's surface and also uh you know does not allow any ultraviolet rays from the sun or any other planet to pen uh, penetrate through the earth okay so this is the importance of ozone layer okay then a uh, few years back uh, like a few decades back we started noticing holes around the ozone layer especially in the antarctic region now that was a cause of worry because if there is a hole or there are any leakages or uh, something on the ozone layer it would allow the ultraviolet rays to pass through so this would cause skin ailments this would cause a lot of problems to the environment as well as the human beings okay so uh, those were mainly attributed to certain gases greenhouse gases for instance and also one thing one huge word which we all learned in school which is cfc or chlorofluorocarbons okay those which are emitted from refrigeration so that is why they ask us to uh, you know close the fridge and keep not only for the electri saving electricity but also to reduce the emission of cfcs you can find it in perfumes in all your uh, aerosols all of them so those are the direct contributors at least 98% is contributed by cfcs which would result in ozone layer depletion all right now so what is ozone layer we call it o3 in terms of you know the chemical compound it's a inorganic gas which has a pale blue color and is distinctively pungent smell so like how you have your uh, ammonia and all that which has a highly pungent smell uh, if you ever got the chance to you know smell it so it it is just a rush of some sort of smell which comes in uh you know in a very concentrated manner so it is and this gas is kind of pale blue in color what it does is we have heard about the reaction of acid rain when you have certain uh, oxides which mixes along with the rain and flows down and causes damage to environment and uh human health we learn about it now so here the ozone reacts with sulfur and nitrogen in order to form sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide and nitrous dioxide which would also result in acid rain now uh, since it is o3 the composition is o3 we have three molecules of oxygen in this and that happens because of ultraviolet ray and atmospheric electrical discharge so if the condition is where ultraviolet light and uh, atmospheric electric discharge is given we can formulate three molecules of oxygen this is how oxygen uh, ozone is formed now when the ultraviolet light passes through o3 uh, that is passes through ozone what happens is it splits that is it's uh, the molecules split into one molecule and two molecules okay so when this is split they get mixed up with other chlorine compounds okay on uh, which is present in the earth's atmosphere and they cause a depletion okay so because of ultraviolet ray the molecules are split into sing one single one and two others which is combined when these molecules combined with the chlorine and other um, gases which is present in the earth's atmosphere they result in depletion of those on layer and who releases those chlorine and you know other gas compounds cfcs okay so this is how ozone layer depletion happens 
Uh, you find it now whatever I have marked is very important because they are repetitive in most of your MCQs. They are found in the atmospheric layer called stratosphere. They are expressed in terms of Dobson's, uh, Dobson unit which means to say you try to measure the physical thickness of the ozone. Okay, So how do you express it? You express in the term of Dobson units which measures what is the physical thickness of ozone if it is compressed in the atmosphere so these are the things which you should know about ozone layer now what causes the depletion so when you uh, the wearing out of the amount of ozone in the stratosphere is called as ozone layer depletion so ozone is one layer and when you start finding some disintegration things are splitting up and causing different gaps we call it as ozone layer depletion they are primarily caused by molecules like of uh, like uh, how i mentioned of chlorine and bromine which is put in the atmosphere in the form of chlorofluorocarbons and bromofluorocarbons so we haven't heard much about the second part, uh, second one but ozone layer depletion can be directly attributed to the chlorine molecules and the bromine molecules to uh, chemical compounds which is released by chlorofluorocarbons and bromofluorocarbons okay now what are the general effects of ozone layer depletion you have skin cancer eye damage damage to the immune system aging of skin effect on marine ecosystem this also has an effect on the plants in the form of flowering and the physiological development process of the plants they might die out you know without completing their entire life cycle so all this happens skin cancer and skin diseases is more of a Thing which we all find even eye damage okay now what are the general effect of uh, on uh, environment and humans like I mentioned skin ailments which can end up in skin cancer which is extreme form disturbed plant life cycle so when a plant you see the picture when the plant starts growing after on a fourth stage it starts tilting and slowly you cannot recover it it's slowly dying off right so that is the destruction of marine life. So ozone layer uh, depletion has an effect on the coral reef. It has a like how we learned in global warming. It has the same effect on uh, coral reefs in you know in and around the world. And then this also destroys the marine life. So because they say that ultraviolet rays uh, is very uh, it it is very easy then for them to penetrate into sea water okay into the seas and oceans so therefore they cause a direct effect on the uh, marine system so this would lean uh, lead to a decline of organisms present in the marine ecosystem especially you have certain uh, you know animal like and plant like organisms which are fed upon by fishes we call them phytoplanktons which you find on the surface of water those are just disintegrated because of ozone layer depletion that is when ultraviolet rays hit the sea's surface okay now what is acid rain acid rain like i mentioned earlier when uh, say ozone combines with uh, sulfur and nitrogen they end up forming sulfur oxide uh, dioxide nitrous oxide and nitrous dioxide so nitrogen dioxide so all three compounds would get mixed up with the water vapor in the present in the atmosphere and they come down as rain so this rain is something which is acidic in nature okay and uh, what happens is it affects vegetation it affects uh, structures especially the marble structures and one such thing which has got you know which is uh, wherein you have ongoing uh, depletion is your effect on Taj Mahal in Agra okay so those are the results of acid rain and many others so let's move on any form of rain which has a low pH that is it has a pH which is below 7 we call it uh, as acidic in nature which which is caused by emission of sulfur dioxide so those words which have been you know a given as bold are very important sulfur dioxide and nitri uh, nitrogen oxide which react with the water uh, molecule or water vapor in order to form acid now there are two forms of acid rain we have wet deposition and dry deposition so when the wind you know blows the acid chemicals to a place which has a very dry weather all right which is blown to a very dry weather 
it does not the acid does not come on the earth surface as rain rather it comes as dust particles or uh, smoke or any other form of dry particle so when the acidic chemicals are blown over by the wind to areas which has dry weather and this these acids fall in the form of dust particles smoke or anything of that sort okay and when chemicals are blown to areas which has got wet weather where it is relatively humid they fall as rain or snow or fog etc so these are the two forms of acid rain now this is the effect of on agriculture and environment where it causes discoloration that is less of uh, you know it uh, spoils up with the pigment and also uh, this leads to loss of vegetation cover the soil is Uh, quality is compromised. So, if you have a lot of acidic compounds present, like which falls on the soil, mixes up with the soil, that soil cannot be used for agriculture. So, all these are the causes. Now, uh, what effect does it have on humans? We have humans who feed on these affected plants and animals ha uh, have the toxins building up inside them. You can result with asthma, with dry cough. So these are not the genetic asthma that I'm talking about. The one which you get from your external environment: headache, throat irritation, brain damage, and kidney problem as well. So when you consume such water, or when you're prone to all those which uh, has, you know, which is contaminated by acid rain falling on them, so this is caused. And you see the statue also. This is a thing which we find almost everywhere. So this. is the effect on uh, structures as well as humans now there are certain international agreements which gained a lot of prominence few of them are the montreal protocol which was signed by all the united nation members we have around 189 as of now right so those which have signed uh, which are already un members they have signed in this in the year 1987 and the plan, uh, protocol was implemented in 1989 now the entire the full form of this montreal protocol is the montreal protocol on substances which deplete the ozone layer so like how the description says those worked for those substances which deplete the ozone layer such as your cfcs and your uh, bfcs as well so what was the agenda their agenda was these agendas are very important all right was to protect the stratospheric oxygen by nations so the Uh, stratospheric oxygen we mean as ozone ozone o3 was found is is always found in the stratospheric layer so here by stratospheric oxygen they mean ozone how through assisting in reaching the goal okay members a country should assist in reaching the goal there should be several international organization who should do study or uh, do research in the field of ozone depletion they should implement those projects which would help in reduction of ozone depleting in substance they should end the production of ozone depleting substance and this served as a forum for all the policy discussions so this was one of the most successful thing which happened compared to all other protocols here they eliminated over 98% of controlled ozone depleting substance they reduced the carbon dioxide Uh, EQ emissions by 135 billion tons. So this was the success of this protocol, which was implemented by all the nations. Second one is your Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the name is given because it was signed in Kyoto, Japan, which is a city there, on 11th December 1997, and they entered into force on 16th February 2005. Like the previous one, this is the entire full form is the Kyoto Protocol to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Okay now what they had an agenda is they wanted to reduce the greenhouse gas effect the other one wanted to reduce the ozone depleting substance which is almost similar but the things which they handled were different okay and the way in which they handled was different so they said that reduce the emissions of six greenhouse gases which is found in uh, 41 countries along with the european union european union is a set of 28 states uh, 28 countries who have adopted the common currency of euro most of them uh, and they work as a common union in the world market so what they have to do along with 41 countries plus the EU, uh, european union has to reduce the emission of six greenhouse gases by 5% from 
uh, the level of uh, gases which was found in 1990 they have to reduce 5% by the term of 2008 to 2010 but the success thing was it was not satisfactory enough there were uh, superpowers such as your us which did not sign in this so uh, many countries followed the same thing so those were the issues and the emissions with respect to the emissions they have not been reduced significantly now we have the next one cbd this is not an agreement it's more of an institution so an international convention whose focus was to preserve biodiversity in the age of genetically modified organisms so there was a boom uh, maybe 12 years 13 years back even in bangalore where they came out with organic compounds which was uh, if you google a bit on this they were mostly opposed by the farmers for example bt brinjal bt cotton okay the biotech that is genetically modified product those were not welcome in our country for instance but this organization believed in preserving the biodiversity of those genetically modified organisms so they used an agreement as their blueprint or as their like how we have the constitution they had a protocol of their own it's called the cartagena protocol which gave the uh, you know um, guidelines for safely controlling the transportation of genetically modified organisms and uh, the uh, success about this organization is that it was a forum for international discussion on you know issues such as bio safety but for it to be actually be implemented it was very hard so most of them were found on paper but implementation was a bit hard now we'll talk about certain uh, natural reserves it's not resources sorry it's natural reserves which is an area of land which is protected by the government okay in order to protect the wildlife present in it or the plants present in it so that they are not subject to issues like hunting or poaching now there are 18 bio reserves in india you normally find in two forms one is national park and wildlife sanctuary national park is one area or say a particular area which is uh, you know a fenced uh, you have a fence around it by which is put in by the government it comes under the jurisdiction of government in order to preserve the wildlife and it is also used for eco tourism for example banargata banargata is not one open thing you have a final boundary to it and if you have been to banargata when you are taken from the lion park to the tiger park you know during the safari all those are within closed enclosures beyond which an animal cannot move out from its like on its free will so these are the national parks in india which are protected by the iucn category to, it comes under IUCN category 2 protected areas. IUCN stands for International Union for Conservation of Nature. So those are the things. Uh, these na national parks come under the second category of IUCN. The first national park was established in 1936. It was called Haley National Park. But now it's called as Jim Corbett National Park. Okay. Especially for the tigers. Yeah. Now as of now. Uh, this is the towards the end of 2019 data which says we have 104 national parks in India. Now wildlife sanctuaries. Now in national parks you had enclosures which is basically used for this tourism as well as protecting uh, the wildlife. But here we we mark a naturally occurring uh, sanctuary, a naturally occurring place as maybe like an island or a forest area which is which protects the species from hunting for example bandipur okay bandipur is a huge forest area wherein animals are allowed to go free yes tourism happens yes people have to uh, take care while they cross the road especially if they're heading to uti or metapalium or somewhere uh, during some hours towards the evening the road is closed because there are sightings of a lot of things so if you have been there it's a very beautiful place try going there now wildlife sanctuaries are protected under category 4 protected list so the other one was category 2 this is category 4 there are 551 existing wildlife sanctuaries so this is what you need to know about natural reserves now human wildlife conflicts that is the uh, interaction between wildlife and human which has a negative impact so interaction between people and wildlife that results in negative impact for human or wildlife population whenever they coexist and share limited resources. For example, and what is the outcome? We have seen these images over and over again. 
okay this image is hidden but you have seen that image right so when there is an injury and loss of life of humans and wildlife there is crop damage livestock depredation uh, there is damage to human property traffic cascades that is an uh, change in the food chain or the food web there's destruction of habitat and wildlife population may also collapse so when say a deer crosses the road and in the normal common case there are bike uh, people who ride bikes who have fallen when suddenly a dog or a goat something passes in front okay they get scared and they skid and fall so these are the human wildlife conflicts which happen there were issues when street dogs used to have a effect on the uh, you know they tried to attack the ch small children and other people and they had to suffer like anything so all these instances we have seen on and off now the tribal population tribes of india which are very much listed in the constitution and which are given immense importance uh, a tribe can be a, called as a social group which live in a fixed territory which has no such specialization of functions. They are mostly primitive that is civilization might not have happened in the complete sense and some of the conditions in which they live might not be fit for human survival. They actually form 8.6% of the total Indian population. We call them by the term Adivasi which is a collective term you use for such population in mainland south asia there are certain common problems so you have geographical separation they are not living maybe in towns and cities there's land alienation they are specified only in one particular land yes there are nomadic groups who move from one area to another area but this happens cultural problems also happen so uh, but in the case of say the seven sisters like assam and all that uh, they have these festivals, uh, it's called Hornbill Festival. You must have heard of it, but, you know, sometime. Wherein all the tribes come together once in a year, once in a year or once in two years, and they have this huge carnival sort of thing. Okay, and tourists always go there to view it. So that is where, that is one method where you can promote the culture, educational pro problems. There are uh, tribal sometimes don't feel not everyone but some don't feel the importance of education now the times have changed but still the people who go to schools and colleges to study is kind of seen in a lesser uh, proportion when it comes to the tribal population economic problems do not uh, many are not given a good standard of life they don't ha have access to many commodities health and sanitation problems especially uh, catering to the maternity and the uh, you know infant uh, sanitation and health those are not given much importance there are people these are people who mostly want to be in their own world they don't want anyone else to interfere in them and neither the, neither do they want to go out as a result they miss out on certain services now these are the rights of tribal population educational and cultural rights is given by article 15 of 4 subsection 4 29 46 and 350 uh, social rights is given under Article 23 and 24, Economic Rights under 244 and 275, Political Rights, that is 160, Article 164, Subsection 1, 243, 330, 334 and 371. Employment rights are given by Article 15, uh, Subsection 4, like how you have the educational rights, you have the same section here. Then Article 16, Subsection 4 and Article 16, Subsection 4A. So these are the different rights which uh, the tribal population has access to and many are not given to them so they end up fighting for this we have different activists uh, you know uh, dealing with this